thanks Aaron and uh, yeah I'm wearing a mask um, as you can see I took a cue from Bo of the fifth column and made my beard uh, mask compliant I also made this mask yeah, there's a lot of tutorials online on how you can make masks I made this one by looking at an actual mask and uh, you know just copying it and it's probably really hard for you to hear anything that I'm saying I imagine it's very muffled uh, but this is the way that everybody's going to be talking now, so I guess we might as well get used to it, right? Nah, I'm just kidding, the novelty will wear off extremely quickly if I wear this through the whole video, so I'm gonna go ahead and take this, uh, thing off, and yeah, I still got, I still got something going on here, but it's, uh, it's a little shorter than before. Alright, so today we're gonna be talking about social distance organizing, um, and how we're gonna go about doing such a thing, uh, in a time of a pandemic such as now. So, I got a bunch of things laid out, and I just gotta say, it is super weird, uh, seeing my face without the rest of the hair. I, I'm not gonna get used to that anytime soon. So anyway, with all that being said, Let's get started. Now, the very first thing uh, that I thought of when I was thinking about different ways that we could use um, tactics for organizing and that sort of thing in the midst of a pandemic when people can't actually go out and physically talk to each other, at least within a certain distance. And uh, the very first thing that I thought of was obviously going out and putting up leaflets. Now, leaflets are a great way to uh, get people organized, to get people interested in what you're doing. But the main problem with that is if if you go door to door uh, putting leaflets in mailboxes or on doors or that sort of thing, uh, first of all, not a lot of people are leaving their house, so they're probably not going to see that stuff for a little while. Um, and also, it's a good way to go around spreading germs. So if there's any way that you can put up leaflets, um, say in uh, less hazardous ways, say up on bus stops, in public spaces, places where people can go up and look at them without actually physically touching them. And make sure that when you're going out putting up these leaflets or whatever you're doing, you're wearing the proper PPE and making sure that you're using every health precaution uh, necessary so you don't infect yourself or anybody else. Now, uh, the next thing that you can do um, is physically getting out there and talking to your neighbors. Now, talking to your neighbors is gonna lead me to all of the other things that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, uh, but it's basically the number one thing that you have to do, because if you don't do that, you're not gonna be able to do a lot of the other things that I'm gonna talk about. Some of the things you can, maybe you might just be a social butterfly and you've already talked to your neighbors and you've already gotten things like phone numbers, like Facebook, that sort of thing, uh, but to find most of those things out, you have to physically go and talk to them, which isn't necessarily a hard thing to do right now in a lot of places, uh, because for some strange reason, more and more people uh, are trying to get outside of their house. Well, I mean, like, you'd have to get outside of your house once in a while. Getting cooped up in here uh, for whoever knows how many months is going to make you go completely insane. Uh, but a lot of people are, at least in my neighborhood and other places, getting outside, going and gardening, doing their sort of thing, um, and people are talking to each other from across the street, from next door, uh, that sort of thing. From the balcony above to the balcony across the street or down on the street below. A lot of people are talking to each other, so why don't we use that opportunity to get people involved, to get people invested in actually doing something that can help. A lot of people are going to be without rent money on May 1st, just like they were on April 1st. So getting to know your neighbors, getting to know your friends, getting to know your family uh, in a more um, political sense in this way uh, is a good idea because then you're able to spread that class consciousness and get more information out there to people so something might actually be solved. Um, now, like I was saying, once you've actually started talking to your neighbors, now you can go ahead and get different things so you can communicate on a regular basis. That means getting their phone numbers so you can text them, so you can call them, making sure that you're getting their emails or their Facebook or whatever apps they use to do video calling. All those things are extremely important because you need to find a way to organize. Um, I have many videos talking about mass line organizing, and that's probably the best way to go about doing it, and it's a three-step process. The first step is talking to the people individually, finding out what their problems are. The second step is getting all of those people together. Physically isn't necessarily possible right now, but digitally you can get all those people together to talk about the problems and find a socialist solution to those problems and then motivate those people to go out and do something about it. So 
uh, and we'll talk about what we can do um, after I talk about different ways that we can actually work towards organizing each other. So obviously there's Facebook, email, talking, texting, video calls, that sort of thing. All of those are extremely necessary and you have to go and get your physical neighbors, phone numbers and so forth so you can actually do that. Some places are going to be more receptive than others. Um, I heard uh, in the States in certain areas, you can't even go door to door uh, because somebody will pull a gun on you. Now, the likelihood of that happening in a lot of places is extremely low, uh, but there are a few places where it does happen. I keep hearing different stories about that. So um, be cautious, that sort of thing. Uh, but try your best to actually get out there and talk to these people. You got nothing better to do. <laughs> So like I was saying before, once you've actually talked to your neighbors, you can do different things like social distance organizing. Uh, you can do that by standing on a balcony across from each other. You can also do that by standing six feet apart. Uh, I've seen lots of people across the entire world um, doing different things like exercises and that sort of thing in the middle of the street with other people uh, on their block. They can't go and see their friends across town, uh, right? Because that could be a risk in a lot of places. So people on their block all get out and go outside and do their calisthenics aesthetics or whatever it is. Um, and it's an opportunity to, to talk to people, right? And it's the same thing here. You can use that as a way to social distance organize uh, with those individuals. You can talk to them. You can uh, do all those sorts of things. That's a great way to hold a meeting and actually get these people together so they can go about doing something in real life. And talking about doing things in real life, uh, now let's talk a little bit about how you can go about protesting in a time of pandemic when you can't even necessarily go outside without being fully garbed in like a hazmat suit. What a dystopian uh, reality we live in right now. But anyway, Moving forward, let's get right into that. So, the ways that you can protest are many and varied, but there are a lot of very effective ones, and some have to do with inside of your workplace, and some have to do with inside of your home or outside of your home. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about all of those right now. So, the very first one that I think about when I'm thinking about a protest um, is a sit-down strike, right? Sit-downs are fantastic because uh, they physically um, occupy, you physically occupy the space in your workplace, wherever it is, stopping people from being able to do certain things. So if you have a sit-down protest um, outside of a building, then you are inherently blocking entry to that building and making it difficult for people to pass. If you make a sit-down protest in a grocery store and you're a grocery store employee, say you work the checkout, uh, if you sit down there at the till, then nobody is going to be able to do your job um, because the till is physically being blocked with a human body so nobody can go over there and actually do the job at the till. So it's a very useful, very um, uh, workable physical activity that you can do. And if you're a grocery store employee and you're stuck there anyway and you want to make some sort of uh, you know, activity, direct action movement, that's one way that you can go about doing it. Okay, so all that being said, obviously if you do any one of these activities, you wanna make sure that you're not doing them alone because doing them alone will inevitably mean that you'll probably get fired, uh, you'll get evicted, you'll get arrested, that sort of thing. Um, but if you do it within a group, if you get a bunch of people working together with you, uh, then the, the likelihood of you actually being fired or you actually being evicted or whatever is significantly reduced and you have more strength when you're with other people. Alone we're very weak, but together we're very strong. That's basically the idea of every single uh, syndicalist movement or every single union group throughout all of history. Uh, we have to work together using the collective bargaining power of all of the workers, of all of the people, uh, to be able to get the things that we want. That's the best way to do it. Another fantastic method of protest, especially right now, is something known as a sick-in. Uh, now, a sick-in is uh, basically the idea where a bunch of people all at once in a business call in sick at the exact same time. You really do have a lot of precedent for that right now because a lot of people are probably getting very sick because of the coronavirus pandemic. So calling in sick a lot of people all at once uh, works very well to stop the progress of that capitalist business. And these people are actually able to use their collective bargaining power to really show force against the capitalist industry that they are working under. So, um, And there's a really strong chance that if everybody all goes home sick all at once, 
once, the capitalist business isn't going to be able to fire all of them all at once. And they're going to basically have to adhere to your demands. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, another way of organizing or another way of protesting within the business right now is something known as a wildcat strike. Now, a regular strike, you usually get together with your union, you get together with a bunch of people, and you officially make it known that you're going to be going on strike on this day, and this is your activity, and this is what you're doing, and this is how it's going to be done, and this is what your demands are. Well, a wildcat strike is... None of that. It's basically an informal protest where a bunch of people, workers, uh, get angry. They might be unionized, they might not be, and they just all together walk out on the job or they just stop working, do a sit-in, whatever it is, and they just stop production immediately. That's a fantastic way of doing a strike and it's known as a wildcat strike. It's an informal, um, non-official type strike and you can do it without any union, you can do it without anything, you just have to be able able to get together with your other co-workers and make sure you all do it together because together, like I said, we're strong, alone we're weak. Another couple of ideas are slowdowns and work to rule. So slowdowns are uh, pretty obvious. You slow down the amount of output you're putting out uh, within your job so you just stop uh, producing as much as fast and a work to rule is kind of similar where you basically stop going over and above on anything and you work specifically to the rules uh, from the way that it was explained to me anyway. So instead of going back to work five minutes early on your lunch break you make sure that you stay your entire lunch break in the lunchroom instead of uh, showing up to work 15 minutes early at the beginning of the day because if you're not there 15 minutes early you're late uh, then you're just going to show up right when you have to start working. Um, it, you're going to make sure that all of the things that you produce, you're doing it to the rule. So using every single safety policy that's around, every single everything to make sure that you're doing that job as slowly as possible. Um, those are both methods of doing slowdowns and it really hampers the capitalist business from being able to produce um, as much as quickly. And also, if you're doing it all together, it's unlikely that they're going to be able to fire you for doing such a thing because you're still technically doing the job, you're just doing it slowly. Um, and a lot of places, at least in Canada, I know a lot of places in the United States have something known as uh, right to fire laws. Uh, where they can just fire you for any reason, but a lot of places um, in Canada and other and in other countries, you can actually uh, do those sorts of things and not get fired as long as you have gone past your whatever it is three to six month probationary period, uh, where they can fire you for any reason. After you've gone past that probationary period, they can't actually fire you without just cause. And just working slowly doesn't necessarily equate to just cause. Now, another form of protest is something known as marching on the boss, which is basically where you get all of the workers together and physically march on the boss, go to where the boss is at, and actually tell them specifically uh, what your grievances are in a big group <laughs> directed right at, right at them. Now, this can be difficult in some situations because in a lot of cases, you don't have that union middleman uh, able to take the voices from every and direct it through a surrogate, right? You instead have all of the people physically talking to the boss and that can be intimidating because a lot of the workers can be afraid of actually saying the things that they want to say to the boss because they could fear that they would get fired. And in that situation, a lot of time, uh, a lot of the time, one specific individual ends up being the one that speaks for most people anyway because they happen to be the loudest or um, they happen to uh, be able to articulate articulate the problems more clearly than anybody else, so that person becomes a target as being the rabble rouser, the one that's causing all of the problems, and then the, um, the management is able to laser focus in on that person and get rid of them. So uh, marching on the boss is a great idea, but it's a greater idea to do it in a way where you can kind of democratically talk um, while everybody is saying something, because if one person says something, then they're going to be singled out. So try not to specifically draw a target on anybody's back that happens to be more vocal or more interested in organizing all of these people. You don't want to have the leadership or leadership of your movement um, immediately taken out when you need them the most. So uh, definitely be cautious when you're doing something like that. 
but it is another method of protest. Uh, another method, which is very useful right now, uh, is something um, that I've been calling either a car, car protest or a vehicle parade, which is basically where you all get inside of your cars and you do exactly what I was saying before, kind of march on the boss. Uh, you all drive down to uh, wherever the boss lives and you honk your horns, you have signs up on your car, you could decorate your car if you wanted to, like a, uh, I don't know, like a paper mache float with a giant guillotine on the top. I don't care what it is that you do, um, but you can do all these things and you're able to socially distance uh, and not actually get in close proximity with one another. So that's a fantastic way to do it. And you can be loud, you can be obnoxious, you can blare your stereo systems all from within the comfort of your own car. Now, if you don't have a job right now, like a lot of people do, you're probably wondering, what can I do? How can I help? How can I get involved? Well, there are a lot of things that you can do as well. From home, you can do things like phone zaps. A phone zap is basically a uh, protest where a bunch of people get together and call a, an organization or a group so often that they completely flood their phone lines and make it impossible for them to do business as usual. Now you can do that to a political representative or you can do that to your landlord or you can do that to your boss, you can do that to any number of people. Oh, by the way, I'm not specifically condemning nor condoning any of the activities I'm talking about. I'm just saying what you can uh, technically do within a free society. So um, those are definitely methods that you could go about um, blocking up those systems uh, and doing phone zaps is a fantastic way of doing that. Another method is hacktivism. Now hacktivism is kind of a controversial method. Again, I don't condemn nor condone it. I'm just saying it is a method of going about doing some sort of protest that directly affects the uh, businesses involved. And hacktivism can be anything from uh, releasing government documents to um, actually hacking into certain computers to uh, any number of things. Hacktivism, look it up. Along with hacktivism, if you're not a hacker or anybody that's super tech savvy, but you are, you know, maybe a comedian, maybe you're a little bit funny, maybe you have a great uh, way of taking complex arguments and boiling boiling them down and condensing them into the, their purest form and producing them in meme fashion, then maybe that's the best way for you to do some activism online is to just get out there and start memeing. Uh, I always praise memes because they're so underrated by so many people, but they get so much attention. And the wonderful thing about memes is they are inherently communistic. Um, they are something that kind of erupts naturally from the uh, audience, from the, you know, aggregate of people online. And from that, it evolves and changes and adapts through every single person that it goes through. Uh, somebody might change some text, somebody might change a picture, they might Photoshop a face onto a thing or do another thing or make it vaporwave, whatever it is. Memes function very similar to a virus where they are able to be released into the public and they adapt and change and morph and grow over time and become more infectious. And some of them last for a short, short amount of time and fizzle off and die quickly and other ones persist and uh, just stay there underneath the radar for a very long time. So memes are a great way to get uh, information out there and it's a great way to show a certain amount of um, activism or protest right now. Normally I would say that it's a low level uh, activity but everybody's online right now. So you have a captive audience and when you have a captive audience you gotta fucking use it. So get out there and use it. Now there's also things that you can do in the real life space, in the meat space, um, such things as dropping large banners. You can put them across bridges, on buildings, on houses, whatever, uh, and they can say things that you want them to say. You can also put signs out on your lawn or in your windows or that sort of thing. Um, if it's good enough for political campaigns, it's good enough here. And it's a great way to get people that are walking their dog or walking by uh, to get a second to look and read something. Um, a lot of people are probably wondering what other people are thinking. So seeing a bunch of signs on, uh, on the uh, street or on somebody's yard might be beneficial in some way. Again, this can cause problems in some neighborhoods if you have a great big um, hammer and sickle <laughs> sign on your uh, front lawn. In some areas, that could be frowned upon and you could bring a lot of attention, negative attention that you don't want to you. So uh, just be cautious on that sort of thing. Um, and obviously, the last couple of things 
are rent strikes and general strikes. Now, rent strikes are something that I talk about a lot on this channel and I have a video uh, link in the description box below and you can check that out and it talks about how you can go about doing a rent strike. And a general strike is a great way to, in fact, it's the greatest of ways, it's kind of like the highest tier um, activism that you can do right below uh, actually storming the gates. <laughs> and for more information on general strike, I wanna direct you all to generalstrike2020.org, I believe is the website. If not, just check in the link in the description box below. Uh, that will lead you to more information on the general strike that people are organizing and working towards uh, right now. So definitely check out all the links in the description box below. That's my show. My name is Aaron. Thank you very much for watching and uh, hit the little bell button because they won't tell you about my channel uh, or any of the videos that come out on it if you don't do that. So thank you very much for watching. Have a great day.